Hey, did you see the the DHH article? Of course you did. We're, we've said we we're going to get on and talk about this. I know you've seen it. I'm, a, I'm an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's been everywhere and a lot of quote tweets because I guess no one can reply. So it just becomes like a quote tweet <laughs> flame fest with every yeah. single post, which, you know, everyone says a part of their marketing strategy, but uh, does it work? Like who, who ends up being like this DHH guy, what a jerk. And then like, Hey, base camp looks nice. I don't know. Is that <laughs> actually a strategy that works? I just would love to see one case where that worked. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what that funnel is. It doesn't make any sense to me, but. the article it was pretty short pretty straightforward and i think it it i can probably summarize it pretty quickly it was just they looked at their bill for aws and what they're paying for um you know rds elastic search paying half a million dollars a year for those services and they're like this is too much just for renting these servers to run the software uh there's gonna be cheaper for us to host it ourselves um and i think in general a lot of people were replying saying oh like for this many users like there's no way your bill should be that high uh i think in general i try to stay away from stuff yeah, like that, that sounds, i just don't yeah. know like no. i don't i don't know what their product is i don't know what it does like everything's always more complicated than than it seems um but i think the thing that's more interesting is that their conclusion was so broad they're like we're paying too much for these services therefore the cloud has no value period yeah. we should go to self-hosting and more of you should consider this as well does that sound right oh yeah it sounds right and i i guess like is the major isn't the majority case people not using the cloud isn't cloud adoption still pretty small and like to make the case that they're like the empire and we're the rebels and we're going to go on prem and do dumb stuff like we're the rebels that i think that's the normal thing he talked about like the cloud and their big like marketing cycles and how they've really like convinced everybody. Have they? I feel like they're just like barely touching the surface of what people should be doing on the cloud. Yeah, I, I, there's a post again, another post on Hacker News that it's the same thread every time about how the cloud is a scam and and it, it's that same comment. It's yeah, we've had a decade of like people tricking us into thinking everything's going to be cheaper, <laughs> and then I don't really know what that what people are referring to um but yeah that is like a sentiment that i think people generally have did you want to defend dhh did you want to like make the case for why maybe you should move away from the cloud is that is that what you were getting at earlier i i think there's some legitimate gaps that because of their service they're running directly into they are an email service that's indexing text um there is no great serverless option yep. in aws for this you're effectively just renting servers from them to run search search. is expensive right yeah comparatively which is pretty expensive um you have to like provision clusters you have to over provision them so that you can meet growth and then continue to over provision them so that sucks and yeah. it's not a good experience and i can see why they might say yeah this is not worth it for us um it's definitely a gap and then also on they're also using rds and there is no i i know aws has their serverless rds which i actually think is pretty good but it's not really serverless right like you're still yeah. kind of more or less it's just kind of like a good auto scaling rds and like a normal rds instance uh so again like very low value in terms of what the cloud can do for them they're kind of just roughly managing these these servers for you so i get their point of view and why they switched in that like specific decision. Um, I think I would have still stuck with it because uh, as some people pointed out, 500K is like two competent engineers times. <laughs> yeah. So like how are much you money not are you gonna actually net? Put? Yeah, I, I feel like you're gonna add two engineers worth of concerns onto your plate by doing all that yourselves, I would think. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I think the thing with stuff that they typically publish is like, makes sense in like their narrow band of what they're working on but the conclusion is pretty broad that the cloud is useless and then that feeds into like some larger debate that's happening on the cloud being useless and people are pointing to it saying hey look look how expensive it is it is useless or is a scam etc 
So yeah, I, I think that's just how this conversation has gone. And I think that most of the people, I think Zachary Cantor had the perfect mm. uh, summary of all this. I don't know if you saw it. He was yeah. saying, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. People are skeptical about the cloud. So they build stuff in a portable cloud neutral way that doesn't take advantage of the cloud. And then they're like, wait, I'm just renting servers that are really <laughs> expensive. Why am I using this in the first place? So yeah. I think that that's just a cycle. And yeah, it's the lowest common happening. denominator. Like we don't know that we want to be here. So we're going to put one foot in the door and that ends up being really expensive. Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't even know. Is it that much more expensive than what you're doing? Even with, with using that lowest common denominator stuff, but then serverless and event driven and all of this, like, is that the answer we can, we can move to that stuff or could for their use case. Can you imagine building hay.com on event driven stuff that you build like an SST? Yeah, I think I actually like the way you phrase it in your, in your video that you put out on YouTube. Um, I think building stuff in this like neutral way can work, but it's hasn't changed in 15 years or, or whatever the time frame yeah. was. Um, there's all sorts of new, interesting ways to build stuff that is very different and throws out a lot of the old stuff. So you're kind of starting from scratch. Uh, but yeah, for something like, Hey, like, you know, I see no reason why it can't be mostly serverless, at least on the compute side, uh, on the database side, I think for a lot of, um, just like the, the, the business logic stuff, like their users or accounts, things like that. Yeah. Dynamo, all those serverless databases, say database options will work great. Um, it's really just a search thing. That's like a killer. Yeah. Uh, that's missing. Did, were you triggered by the renting computers? Like just that summation of what the cloud is. Cause he makes a point to be like, this is what the cloud is. We're afraid to say yeah. it, but that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I always have this dual thing where I'm like, that annoys me. But then I'm also like, I remember when I used to say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you were the, you were Kubernetes, right? You were, you were doing. Yeah. All that lowest common denominator stuff. Yeah. I agreed with every single point in this article at one point. Oh, who DHH? This article? Yeah. That's awesome. So do you agree? What what do you what do you agree with still? What do you not agree with at all? I mean, I think I just I agree with all of it, except it's like, but you haven't discovered this other thing, you know? It's like within your limited view of the world, yeah. your logic is flawless. And could but. they discover the other thing or are they always going to use Rails? And can you build a Rails app that takes advantage of all this stuff? Uh, I actually don't know. I'm not, I'm not that familiar with Rails. I don't think so. Cause I think I've actually, I've done some hosting for clients, hosting Rails apps on AWS. And I don't yeah. know that you could really take advantage of like modern no, probably not. driven stuff. You can replace like your queue with SQS instead of Sidekick, and you can replace, uh, I guess, like instead of running Redis, just right. in another compute like your Rails app, you can run it in Elasticache or whatever. But I don't know. It's all still again that pretty expensive stuff on AWS. It's not. It's not the new yeah. thing. Yeah, with this type of thing, it's. I think everyone's looking for the incremental step of here's how I used to do things. I'm moving to the cloud and here's this incremental way of moving my stuff there, which is just lifting what I have and putting in the cloud. And the results are disappointing because these incremental steps aren't going to get you to anything game changing. You kind of have to, like, I, realistically, I don't think moving to the cloud is really an option. I think you have to wait for new companies to just start in this cloud native yeah. way. So when people move to the cloud, they just run servers in the cloud and they're like, this is expensive and it sucks. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that, that's something I think about like incumbent companies and the disadvantage they have mm -hmm. if they built their thing a, a decade ago. Like, I think it's hitting exactly what you're just saying. Like, I don't know how you move that stuff into this new world. Like, can you strangler pattern your way into, well, I guess Lego.com. So Lego did it. Yeah. But I mean, did they end up in like it just rewrote most everything over time? But they they yeah. had like a successful migration into now like best practice. Like they're leading the way, kind of showing how teams can build this way with multiple teams. And uh, yeah, but I think of like a company like what is the company what that makes Basecamp? What is their company called? Thirty Seven Signals. Thirty Seven Signals. I think yeah. of them as being like they are. Yeah, they're never going to change in that way Never. that article is sort of reflective of that and they have so much experience building things the way they build it like right. decades of like literally creating that pattern so so it's probably better for them like they would never move as fast with the new stuff than they can move with the thing they've been doing for a decade yeah and it's a pretty small company too it's not like you're 
So yeah, I, I get it. It just smaller, makes sense for that. Smaller all the time. The more inflammatory DHH can be <laughs> on the internet, <laughs> the more people leave. 36 signals, 35 <laughs> signals. Uh, I love making fun of these giants like I've ever done anything in my life. Like <laughs> just sit back here and throw stones. Uh, what do I know? I can't even find, I'm looking at the article trying to find the thing that I totally blanked on earlier and I literally can't find it. It's not even that long of an article. I don't know. Uh, he does talk about like, it works on two ends of the spectrum, uh, the one end, and it feel, I feel so called out when he says the first end is when your application is so simple and low traffic that you really do save on complexity by starting with fully managed services. I feel like that's a sentence I would say, like, you can start <laughs> simply with <laughs> these fully managed yeah. services. And I never make it out of that part. Like, I never get to the part where it's not just simple and low traffic. Uh, but then what's he say about the, the higher end of the spectrum? Oh, yeah. Second is when your load is highly irregular. Okay, so he's saying the cloud doesn't make sense if you have predictable anything. It only makes sense if you need to be able to burst and scale at these crazy bursty rates or if you're tiny and you don't have any traffic. What do you, what do you take from that? Yeah, I think the math on that is actually counterintuitive. I think he's kind of intuiting that, oh, if we have consistent load there's not going to be a big difference going to something that's serverless. Um, but if you actually do the math, it's pretty crazy. You know, if you're constantly serving, you know, 10 requests a second, for example, that seems like a lot, like a constant 10 requests loaded, I should pre-provision stuff. But if each of those requests only take a hundred milliseconds each, you're actually overpaying by 90% because, you know, in that one second, you're only using, um, like one, 100, like a hundred milliseconds of that second. So if you actually like do out the math, run the math out, um, yeah. the I'm savings can be pretty, pretty crazy. You have to multiply this by like, uh, high availability. So you don't have to have one copy of stuff. You have multiple copies of stuff. It's, it's kind of surprising sometimes what, for what feels like constant load is actually mostly empty space. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, I think again, like you just have to do the math out on your own and see, see what you get to, but I've always been shocked when I've moved companies to serverless stuff. I like knew it was going to be cheaper, but it's often like a crazy, ridiculous multiple cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it shouldn't be cheaper when you have less you need to do. He, he makes the argument that you would have like cloud has promised you'll need less staff to manage your thing. And if, if it's cheaper, even without factoring that in, I think like if it were the same, it still should be cheaper total cost, right? That's the whole total yeah. cost of ownership thing. Like ultimately having fewer concerns, fewer operational burdens should mean your team can focus on things that are more important. But DHH is making the argument that medium sized companies, that's not the case. Uh, you can afford to just hire people who manage infrastructure. Oh, that's the thing. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. The thing that I forgot earlier. I should stop emphasizing it because I'm going to forget again. Uh, <laughs> the thing is, he makes the claim uh, that it's really complicated to have people that can manage your AWS stuff. Like that's just as complicated as managing your on-prem stuff. And I think, again, we're talking about the difference in running lowest common denominator like yeah. VMs and stuff and using event-driven modern managed services. Yeah, which again, he's, he's correct because back when I did all the Kubernetes stuff, I much preferred managing bare metal Kubernetes than like, AWS's flavor or like Google's flavor. Yeah. Google's flavor is actually pretty good, but yeah, again, makes total sense. Um, I think the other thing he mentioned was no company he knows of has scaled down their operations team as a result of moving to the cloud. That's and totally, yeah. I mean, that's so unsubstantiated. Like I'm yeah. sure there are plenty of cases. I'm not going to substantiate them as well, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, even if it's not substantiated, I think this is one of those paradox things where uh, when something becomes cheaper or easier to use, you use more of it. So it's okay that your operations team didn't shrink. Um, your engineering team might have even grown even as a result of moving to the cloud. But if you break it down to what they're doing, what they're focusing on, like you're, if you have resources to spend on hiring, and you're not going to like cut that, right? Because yeah. presumably you have good stuff that people can be doing. So yeah, teams generally don't shrink. They might even grow, but it's maybe because they can more easily add more people mm. and have them do the useful things they, they need them to do. So the simple, this like simple way of just looking at it as, oh, did you fire people or not? <laughs> like, I don't, 
that the company yeah. is probably not a good company if that's what they ended up doing. I've, I've heard you in the past say like at companies, there's never a shortage of things to do. You're always sacrificing yeah. what you could be working on to work on something. So yeah, yeah. In that sense, I guess he's maybe he's trying to argue that like you have people that are specifically they have expertise with managing mm-hmm. AWS stuff and you need those people if you don't have the people who are specifically good at managing infrastructure and like on-prem stuff or whatever hybrid class. I don't even know all that world. I know nothing about <laughs> it, but like, I guess my view of the future is people who are good at all of it. And yeah, exactly. Like one role. It's like the event driven serverless stuff feels much more. One developer has so much more leverage than they did 10 years ago. And that's a good thing. And you hire everyone you can get your hands on and convince to work at your company. And you don't think about what they're doing. You just know <laughs> they're capable yeah. of doing any of the things across the stack. I don't know. Maybe that's some utopia that doesn't exist, but that's how I like to think of the future. No, I, I think it, uh, I think it is happening, right? Even myself, I'm doing more, you know, quote unquote ops work than I ever have before. Not because of anything with me, it's just become much more accessible and easy for me to do. So I don't need to yeah. outsource that into another person. So yeah, I agree. It's just ideally you want a company where everyone's the less specialization, the better in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, I think more people just do the ops role and you have the same number of people, but it's not this thing where like the developer finishes their their work and they give it to the ops person to figure out their thing. And there's all this overhead and communication and stuff that uh, goes wrong in that process. So, yeah, I think to me, it's more about making ops work just become normal application developer work. And that's kind of the ultimate goal. Yeah. I'm trying to find the uh, Simon Wordley had a tweet and I loved it so much in response to this DHH thing. I love Simon Wordley because you'll be like, hey, did you see that article? from dhh and he's like no who's that (laughs) (laughs) he's just so he's so cool uh and he's like retired from cloud but he still knows more than we'll ever like unlearn uh but he basically was laying out like what are you even talking about like cloud infrastructure stuff like if you're not on serverless you're dead like it's over (laughs) you you missed the boat and i love it i just love that take so much because i just hate i hate when i see these arguments pop up and it's like that we're having to defend it's better to do less undifferentiated dumb stuff at your company i hate having to defend that like it just seems so obvious to me and i guess like there are edge cases that's simon's point is like there are these edge cases the problem Mm -hmm. is too many people thinking they're the edge case and like the majority of people should be building their thing when i think about base camp like Mm -hmm. task management or something i've never seen base camp in my life and i hope to never have to but because i don't work on teams not a slide at like 37 signals i'm just saying like i don't use software to coordinate with people because i don't coordinate with people Uh, but if i did (laughs) i imagine software where you're just like managing tasks and like action items and like workflows and all that nonsense and communication i would imagine you can build that on the thing that allows you to not think about literal servers and os's and networking and like if you're thinking about that stuff to build that app then there is no use case for serverless. Like if serverless can't solve that, if event-driven applications can't be built that solve that problem, like there's nothing complicated about that problem. Am I wrong? Is there something about Basecamp or that use case that like demands serious infrastructure investment and understanding on your team? No, I think pretty much in every category now, you can find one company that's doing fully serverless stuff. And not a yeah. product, you can probably find a comparable product that is built with this new architecture. So yeah, at this point, it's like, you can't argue it doesn't work. And I actually think this is the way it's always been. I'm sure there was a time where someone was like, if you're not literally, you know, putting your CPU on your motherboard <laughs> and building your server, uh, like there's something wrong with that. Or like, you yeah, know, you're getting tricked to buy these pre-assembled you servers. bought into the marketing. Yeah. With these um, machine and makers. Just life goes on and we build higher and higher abstractions and we build on top of other things that exist. Like all the way down to like, we're not worrying about the electricity getting to our server. Like it's just, there's just so many infinite layers over the thousands of years of work. So yeah, I think it's just kind of dumb to fight these things. So um, is there just this, what is the, like, what is the ending here that makes me feel better because all these stupid arguments crop up because of these dumb blog posts sorry i'm so inflammatory i think i'm an inflammatory person i'm learning uh <laughs> i just get very upset about things and i shouldn't uh because it doesn't affect me but 
like I get all fired up. I see this article. I see the whole debate rage on again, and it just bothers me so much. Is there going to be like an unceremonious ending to all that? Like this is not going to be some big moment where I get to be like, see, it made yeah. sense. You know what? That's what sucks. There's never that satisfying moment. Yeah, um, it's not going I to. I feel it's like just... I've seen this enough times now where there was a time where everyone hated static. Not everyone, but there's a lot of debate around static typing and type safety. And it was just like, that's dumb or like, that's just yeah. dumb overhead. And TypeScript came out and just slowly got incremental adoption every single month. And now everyone's using it. And no one is, there was never a moment where it was like, ha ha. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's just, you go six months and you realize, and this is real, like, honest assessment for me. I feel like I've gone six months and not seen somebody argue against TypeScript. And that's, like, the first time on Twitter I think I've gone six months without seeing that argument. So it does feel like it just, oh, yeah, people used to argue about that. It just disappears. It just disappears. Yeah. We we, we should maybe do, like, someone out there should, like, archive this stuff of, like, okay, here's the debate. And I should publish... The debate is over. It hasn't come up. And like, oh, it feels you know, so good. Yeah, remember when people so were saying X, Y, Z? Um, <laughs> yeah. I think of it, I've got kids. I think of it like uh, we forget all about like the first year when we didn't sleep at all. Like at the <laughs> moment, it feels like this is never going to end. This is my yeah. whole life. It's so consuming. And then years later, you're like, oh yeah, that just stopped. And I don't, I didn't think about the fact that it stopped. So eventually the DHH articles about dumb stuff well it's not dhh this is his first moving away from the cloud article i think uh <laughs> it's not dhh he's just the symbol right now but eventually these arguments will stop cropping up and we'll stop having to defend why it's good to focus on the thing you're trying to build and not all the other things and that's what it is i mean that's what i don't think of the term cloud or serverless as being clear in that regard i think that's what we're focused on though when we talk about a thing we're talking about more focus on real problems, less focus on undifferentiated stuff, right? Yeah, I agree. And, you know, to be honest, it is as annoying as it is and as much energy it takes up. On some level, I think we all enjoy being yeah. part of a group that's trying to make what we see, like the next thing happen with a bunch of people being like, no, this old thing is better. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's, again, that's why, the, you know, it's why uh, <laughs> I can't side with Vercel because they have like one. So I want my looking for the next thing. <laughs> that same thing in me that I kind of want to be the underdog to some degree. Yeah, that's why the Star Wars movies are good. We're the rebellion. <laughs> yeah. So this was harder to talk about than I thought it'd be. I thought like when that article came out, I was like, da- I got to get on with Dax and talk about this because I was so fired up. And then we got on and it was kind of like, I don't know. Do I have coherent thoughts about this topic? Maybe not. We'll see. The podcast listeners can tell us. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I kind of feel the same way. I think... Uh, it turns out we've there's nothing new in this. I've kind of heard this a million yeah. times, and we've probably talked about it a million times. So I feel dumb even saying like TCO. I feel like dumb, like I'm like being pedantic, or like I'm being not pedantic. I'm being like I'm talking down to the audience, trying to say terms like that when I feel like they've been beat so hard. That drum has been drummed, and I don't need to explain total cost of ownership to anybody anymore. But I guess <laughs> I do. I guess there's people that still don't see the, the world that way. And maybe never will. I don't know. Okay, I really don't have an ending for this one. I didn't have a middle. <laughs> I didn't have a beginning. I don't have anything for this one. I just, I'm just fired up. <laughs> uh, this has been fun. I'm really enjoying uh, not doing new guests and just talking to Dax all the time. Yeah, it's, it's good not to just have these conversations with myself in my head all day yeah, exactly yeah, we yeah. leave it out here and we can kind of move on so my, uh, yeah my listeners may disagree they might wish some of my things just stayed <laughs> in my head but <laughs> uh feels good to me i'm enjoying it i'm enjoying getting it all out of my head yeah all right it's been good thanks dax see ya see ya